was on March 18, 2023, when mother of six Angela Craig in Denver, Colorado was pronounced brain dead at 4.29 p.m. But what was the cause? Angela had been completely healthy when she was suddenly plagued with a mysterious illness, and it had started a course of debilitating illness, ultimately causing her organs to shut down. It mystified doctors. It had only been a few days prior on March 5th. When 43-year-old Angela returned home after a trip to Utah to visit her sister. On the morning of March 6th, Angela messaged her husband, 45-year-old James Craig, after not feeling well. They started talking about the protein shake that he had made for her that morning, and she had asked if James had added more vitamins than she normally took. She was feeling dizzy and her head was foggy. She eventually went to the hospital emergency room at Parker Adventist Hospital, but they couldn't find the cause and they sent her home that same day. A few days later on March 9th, she was suffering from a worsening of symptoms. She was dizzy and having a hard time focusing. She had also started vomiting, couldn't keep medication down, had headaches, and was starting to become extremely dehydrated. She was admitted again to the Parker Adventist Hospital. She was tested for everything that they could think of. In text messages between her and her husband and her and her friend, they discussed how it was believed that she might have diabetes or an autoimmune disorder, but all the tests were coming back negative. In text, James wrote to Angela, quote, Baby, I love you so much. I wish I could just stay up there for 24-7 and be with you. I know it's lonely and boring and maybe sometimes scary, and I just want to be there to support you through all of it. James was constantly messaging his wife, asking how she felt, if she was improving, and how much he loved and cared about her and wished her well. For days, she would not see much, if any, improvement. She would be in the hospital until March 14th when they could not figure out what had been wrong with Angela. She was discharged and put on oxygen at home. Less than 24 hours later, Angela's brother rushed her to the Colorado University Hospital at approximately 11 a.m. Her husband, James, would arrive very soon after she was admitted. Angela complained of a severe headache and dizziness, and at approximately 2 p.m. she had a seizure and would start to decline rapidly. Doctors struggled to intubate and she suffered intracranial pressure and no pupil response. Angela was moved to the intensive care unit and doctors said her prognosis was very dire. His business partner and best friend arrived and pulled a nurse aside. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. Informing her that they had suspicions that Angela may have been poisoned by her husband. He went on to explain that an employee of his had come to him that morning reporting an odd encounter that she'd had with Dr. Craig earlier that week. Right before Angela had gotten sick, she said that an odd package had been delivered to the office and she opened it accidentally. Inside was a substance that they did not use nor had any reason to be delivered to their dental practice. The substance was labeled as potassium cyanide, and when Dr. Craig noticed that she'd opened the package, he said that it was a personal item and took it into his office. They hadn't thought much about it, but when Angela had gotten so sick and was still so sick, she considered the package and that it might not have been a mysterious illness after all. That was when she told the other managing partner what she'd seen. However, this realization would come too late. But who was Angela Craig? Born Angela Dawn Prey, she was born on April 15, 1979 in Dodge City, Kansas. She was part of a big family, one of ten children, and she got out of Dodge, as her obituary said, after marrying James Craig on December 18, 1999. In the 23 years of their marriage, she had six children and the family had lived in Denver, Colorado. They had lived in the area for 15 years. She was described as kind, energetic, intelligent, and had a good humor, the sort of person that would show up for anything, and she had a huge ability to forgive. Both Angela and James were elders in the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. James counseled youth, and Angela was the choir director and also worked as a family history consultant for their church. Angela had also confided in her sister that James had an addiction to pornography and had been caught having multiple affairs. 
She also revealed that James was also gambling and he was in a considerable amount of debt. The family had already filed for bankruptcy in 2021 and they were likely going to have to file again. James was on the verge of losing their home and business. Law enforcement arrived at the hospital just after midnight on March 16th. Shortly after their arrival, they learned Angela was in a coma and that doctors were unsure if she was going to make it through the night. On March 18th, at 4.29 p.m., Angela was pronounced brain dead and James opted to pull the plug. He had also been adamant with the hospital not to do an autopsy and wanted to quickly arrange a cremation. The investigation into her death started before she had been pronounced dead. However, James wasn't unaware that there was an investigation into her death that had started long before the 18th. Angela's toxicology would show that she had three different unusual substances in her system at the time that she died, potassium cyanide, arsenic, and tetrahydroxylene, and her death was ruled a homicide. The police investigation started on March 16th. They got search warrants for the home, dental practice, and James devices. Multiple workout style shakers used to drink those protein powders, a computer tablet, two different unlabeled plastic bags with a white powdery substance, and a water bottle on an exercise bike. A child protective services caseworker would also contact law enforcement after they had interviewed James and his children individually. They informed law enforcement that James had made some concerning statements, focusing on that he had said that Angela had severe depression and had been suicidal for some time. James had also told the caseworker that he had found Angela after attempting to take her life and had personally revived her on several occasions. He also said that he had asked his wife for a divorce in December 2022 and that her depression had got much worse after that. He informed the caseworker that she had previously overdosed on opioids and that she would likely have something in her toxicology report, but he didn't know what it would be. The caseworker felt compelled to report this to the police because none of the children reported any kind of depression from their mother or any previous suicide attempt. The children ages range from 20 to 8 years old. Certainly the older kids would have noticed their mother having some sort of decline in mental health, but they hadn't noticed anything unusual with their mother. The caseworker ultimately believed that it would be unlikely that no one else living in the house other than James would have missed these signs or evidence of depression or suicide. They thought it was very much more likely that James was setting up a cover story. James' business partner and his wife would provide the police with statements and screenshots of their text message conversations that James had with them. James and his business partner had gone to dental school together, and they had known each other's families for decades. They knew Angela and the kids and were deeply concerned about James' behavior while Angela had been ill. The messages include a message to his business partner expressing how mad he was that he had told authorities about the package that had been delivered to the office, and that he was very unhappy that the children had to see their mom for the last time after police had gotten their evidence. He said that if he cared for them at all, he would not talk to the police unless forced. This was the message James sent to his business partner, quote, I understand why you did what you did. I do, I get it. But if you'd come to me personally, man to man, instead of talking to everyone else about what you thought you knew, I might have let you in on some details that would have made you less likely to cause this horrible storm. If you had only put me higher on your list of priorities instead of putting everyone else's opinions and gossip ahead of me. For that, I'm very, very mad at you. With the search of both James and Angela's phone, police were able to check past text message conversations between the couple on the days that led to the 18th. First, they found a conversation about not telling her sister about conversations that they'd had the night before. This conversation happened on March 1st when she was visiting Utah. The conversations would also include her time not feeling well, including the first day she wasn't feeling well, and James' message, quote, given our history, I know that this must be triggering. For the record, I didn't drug you. I'm super worried, though. You really looked pale before I left. Like in your lips, even. And while Angela had still been in the hospital, he texted this message to a friend. Quote, If it wasn't my wife, this would be kind of a fun puzzle to try to work out. Angela's sister would later tell the police that James had drugged Angela approximately five to six years prior. She said that Angela had told her that she had been drugged with an unknown substance because James had told her he had done it so that he could go to the bathroom and give himself a lethal injection. He apparently drugged her so that she would not find him or be able to stop him before the injection took effect. Angela had apparently told her that there had been no evidence that he'd ever tried to commit suicide. 
and the two didn't speak of it again. Her sister also told police that the marriage between James and Angela had always been tumultuous. James had multiple affairs over the years, and he had told his wife he'd been addicted to pornography since he was a teenager. Law enforcement would talk to the office manager from dental practice. She had worked as their office manager for about six months. And she told police in her interview that she'd been told that on March 6th, James and his wife had worked out together and that he had given his wife extra protein in her shake because she was feeling sluggish and that she had started to feel unwell and had been taken to the hospital. And after his wife had been discharged the first time, she had found James in exam room 9 on a computer in there, which had been odd because he had his own computer in his office and a laptop that he often took home with him. He would not have needed to use that computer except with a patient, and he was alone. Shortly after she left the office, with James still in the exam room, she got a text message from James saying that a package was going to be delivered to the office, but it was personal and to not open it. In the following days, Angelo was back in the hospital. James had said he was unsure if his wife was quote-unquote going to make it, in the same sentence and also asked how the business was doing, which she had found odd. On March 13th, when the package arrived, the office manager discovered that one of the other office staff had opened the package, not knowing it was for James personally. The office manager went to reseal the package so she could put it in James' office when she noticed a packing slip for potassium cyanide. She had never seen it delivered to the office, and she didn't know a need they would have for it. She resealed the package and hand-delivered it to James. When Angela was back in the hospital, she looked at the side effects of cyanide poisoning and it matched her symptoms. That was when she then informed the business partner. On March 17th, police started to look into James' web history. They discovered that on the computer hard drive found in exam room 9, James had another Gmail account, different than the one that they knew. With this email, James had conducted searches for how many grams of pure arsenic to kill a human. Is arsenic detectable in an autopsy? The same account was used to order arsenic metal from Amazon on February 27, 2023, and it was delivered to his home on March 4th. More searches were conducted, including YouTube searches for top five undetectable poisons that show no signs of foul play. How to make poison the top 10 deadliest plants that can kill you. The top five undetectable poisons video listed both cyanide and arsenic as follows, quote, cyanide found in countless items in the home and other locations. 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight is a fatal dose for humans. Arsenic is virtually undetectable besides the Marsh test used in murder and mystery. This was not only the chemical that was ordered using this Gmail account. James had also ordered potassium cyanide from Midland Scientific. His order confirmation came through on March 9th after some emails back and forth for proper forms to be signed. In the emails, James said it was for surgery and he needed delivered the next day. The emails between Midland Scientific and James showed that he would get the package on March 13th, not the next day. This is believed to be the package that was opened by office staff. While looking into this new email, police would also find correspondence between a woman and James that seemed to be intimate in nature. Two flight itineraries were found with this woman traveling from Austin, Texas to Denver, Colorado. The dates of these flights were March 8th to 10th and March 16th to 20th. The second itinerary was purchased on March 4th, the same day that the arsenic arrived. And they were able to learn that this woman was an orthodontist, who James had met at a conference earlier in the year. She has since had an interview where she explained that when they met she was in the final stages of a lengthy divorce and that James had told her he was also getting a divorce. According to her, James had told her that he was already living apart from his wife. The two had lengthy conversations about the struggles they faced while ending long marriages, bonding over navigating moving forward, and other experiences that she believed they were both experiencing. The two had only just started dating and it hadn't been a serious relationship yet, and she hadn't been rushing into anything. She has since fully cooperated with law enforcement once all of his lies came to light. She wanted to set the record straight that they had not started talking about a future together, so she didn't believe that she had been any sort of motive to murder Angela. She also said that had she known he was still married and living as his wife, she wouldn't have ever dated him. She also revealed that the two had two dinner dates together. While his wife was on life support in the hospital, 
James had told her that his wife was sick in the hospital and she said that he didn't seem stressed or anxious at that time. On their second date, James had said that Angela was dying so she ended their date insisting that he should be with his family. Experts speculated that it had been the protein shakes that James had been preparing for Angela that had been poisoned as it was the only thing in the home that wasn't consumed by the rest her toxicology showed that she had likely been given small amounts at first. And when it wasn't working fast enough, she had been given larger and ultimately more lethal doses, showing that it wasn't an accident and had been a calculated, thought-out plan James had designed to end his wife's life with intent. And malice. News reports also show that Angela had three life insurance policies with the beneficiaries being James Craig. James had lost a considerable amount of money from investing in cryptocurrency. His business partner described James as a significant risk taker and took that approach to investing, but it had put him into millions of dollars of debt. James Craig has not made a plea at this time, and he has been assigned a public defender. Angel's family, including the children, have asked for privacy. James was initially held without bond because it was a capital offense, but a Colorado Supreme said that judges must set a bond in first-degree murder cases. However, the bond was ultimately set at 10 million cash only. James does not seem to have paid that at this time. James Craig was set to put in a plea for the charges against him, but they have been delayed and at the time of recording have not recurred. James Craig has not been convicted of this crime and the trial will likely go forward. If you'd like me to cover the trial or give any updates on the outcome, Leave a comment down below. So what are your thoughts? Do you think James killed his wife? And do you think the motive was money or being with another woman? It was on October 13, 1987 in Boise, Idaho, when Joyce Casper was found in her car, just a few blocks from her business, Casper's Vista Hallmark and gift shop. She had been murdered and her death would shake the community. Joyce was 65 years old when she died. Joyce is well known in the community to be kind and caring. She and her husband, who was a pharmacist, owned a pharmacy until 1986, until they opened Casper's Vista Hallmark and gift shop. Her husband John Casper had died in 1982 and Joyce continued to run the shop after his death. John and Joyce had three children together, two daughters and one son. Joyce was known to work late and it wasn't odd for her to be at the shop until very late in the evening. So she could have been attacked any time between the evening of October 12th and the early morning of October 13th. Authorities would eventually release that they believe Joyce had been abducted from her shop, sexually assaulted and strangled to death before being put in her car and driven away. Another significant piece of evidence was that Joyce had reported being attacked in her shop two weeks prior to her murder but she had managed to scare him off and the attacker had run away quickly. During the encounter, he had attempted to assault her. She reported that the man was in his late teens, early twenties with slicked back black hair, nor the man who had killed Joyce. The case would go cold very quickly, with no witnesses and very little evidence that could be used in 1987, and all the leads soon dried up. But in 1988, another attack similar to Joyce's reopened the case. Another woman in her 60s had been attacked, but in her case, her attacker was found quickly and denied having any involvement with Joyce's case. Even though there were several similarities, the case would again turn cold, and it would stay that way for decades. It was reopened in 2005 when they took another look at the evidence that had been preserved in 1987. However, at that time, nothing new came up. But in 2017, Two detectives were assigned permanently to the case and scientific advancements had caught up with DNA analysis. They sent a DNA sample believed to have been from the suspect to Parabon Nanolabs. They were able to create a computer-generated profile of the potential suspect. They would release that they believed the suspect was Latin American, possibly from Puerto Rico or Colombia. The data from the genetic markers would reveal that he had brown or hazel eyes, brown or black hair, and that he didn't have freckles. In 2017, they would admit that some of this, like the hair, may have changed in the 30 years since the murder, but that they had hoped someone would recognize the composite created by their program. In 2019, a new detective would start to work the case, this time working with Identifinders International in the hopes of using genetic genealogy to help find a suspect. This analysis would take until 2023 to reveal the suspect.
and it was in July 2023 when the Boise Police Department announced they had found a suspect in the 36-year-old cold case, Frank A. Rodriguez. Unfortunately, no rest could be made as Rodriguez had died in 2007 by suicide. Authorities met with his family, taking DNA swabs which were analyzed and proved through genetics that Rodriguez was the suspect. Even though he had passed, both the retired Boise detectives that had worked the case and the Casper family were relieved to have some answers about what had happened to Joyce after all this time. Rodriguez had a history of violent outbursts, mental health issues, and substance abuse. But he didn't have a criminal record. At the time of Joyce's murder, he would have only been 17 years old and he lived only blocks away from the store. He spent the rest of his life living in the area and is being investigated in connection to other cold cases in Idaho. Rodriguez's physical description at the time also matched report Joyce gave from the attempted assault that had taken place at her store two weeks prior to her murder. Police have asked if anyone knows anything about Frank A. Rodriguez to contact the Boise police as they believe this is probably not his only crime. It was on May 3, 1975, when a farmer was checking the back end of his property near the Nation River about 40 kilometers east of Ottawa, Canada. He noticed something floating in the river, and there he found a woman's body, face down, in the water. Before doing anything, he called the police. The Ottawa Police Department arrived and discovered a woman's bloated, naked body with a cloth covering her face. She had a dark blue, leotard top. Bunched up around her neck, her hands had been bound in front of her with a blue necktie with Canadian flags and her ankles had also been bound with two additional men's ties. The cloth around her head was described as two pieces of a bloody green fabric, a disposable hand towel, and a distinctive Irish linen tea towel. Loosely wrapped around her neck was a television cable, and a piece of a curtain rod runner could be found in her armpit. The autopsy would put her age between 25 and 35. She had shoulder-length dyed red hair that was believed to have been brown naturally with hazel or blue eyes, believed to be about 100 pounds, and she was 5 foot 5 tall. Both her fingers and toenails were painted red. She had a high-quality partial dentures with multiple fillings, having police believe that she was of a middle-class background. They stated that it appeared she'd never had children, and she'd had her appendix removed. She'd also eaten a large meal right before her death. Her larynx had been fractured and her case was ruled a homicide due to the nature of the body's decomposition that couldn't determine if she'd been sexually assaulted. Her body was believed to have been in the river for about one to four weeks, putting her time of death between April 5th and April 26th. Police believe she'd been dumped in the river from a nearby bridge. When they investigated, they found blood on the bridge. It wasn't enough to get a blood type at that time, but they assumed it was from the woman. There had been heavy rain on April 19th, so that led authorities to believe she'd been dumped between the 19th and the 26th. All of this information and police had one key piece missing. They couldn't identify the woman. They combed hundreds of missing persons reports. They contacted dentists locally as the Jane Doe had a custom denture made for her and several fillings. Their forensic dental imprints were published in dental journals in North America and overseas. No one recognized them. Law enforcement knocked on doors in a 25 kilometers radius of the bridge. They tracked down where the TV cable had been sold and checked hotels and motels where it might have been installed but nothing. The necktie that had bound her had been made in Montreal and sold all over Ontario and Quebec. The tea towel from Ireland was imported by a Toronto company and sold in mass quantities until 1972. Nothing seemed to spark any leads. Without knowing who the woman was, the police had very little to go on. Was she from Canada? Was she a visitor? Had she recently moved here? Had she come from Montreal or was just dumped near Ottawa, which at the time was a technique often used by criminals to confuse detectives? She would be dubbed the Nation River Lady, and she'd stay in a Toronto morgue until 1987, 12 years after the discovery. She was eventually buried in Toronto Mount Pleasant Cemetery. News of her burial would bring in some fresh tips, but would lead to dead ends. The Nation River Lady would be in the news every few years, with new sketches and advancements, but still they couldn't identify the woman. It wasn't until 2023 when Canadian officials would announce that they not only had identified the Nation River Lady, 
but had a suspect in custody. The Nation River Lady was identified as Jewel Parchman was 48 when she died and had traveled from her hometown in Tennessee and moved to Montreal in April 1975. She was a successful businesswoman who owned a spa with her ex-husband, and she'd been well missed by her family, who'd reported her missing shortly after not hearing from her in 1975. Her parents and siblings had all passed by the time she was identified, but she still had some nieces who helped identify her after all these years. Jewel was identified after her body was exhumed in 2019 for a new DNA profile, which the Canadian authorities shared with US-based DNA Do E project. Using genetic genealogy, they could upload the results into the database shared with the police. Quickly, they found a match and had new samples taken from living relatives, which Canadian labs confirmed. They'd been able to make the announcement privately with the family in 2020 that they had identified Jewel. This was kept out of the press in the hopes of finding more information about her killer. The suspect was also identified via genetic genealogy. Florida native Rodney Nichols is now 81 years old and was living in Montreal and worked as a professional rugby player at the time of the murder. It would come out that Nichols had been dating Jewel at the time. It is being reported that once he was arrested, he confessed to the murder, but this is now being called into question by his lawyer. In the confession, he said that he killed her because she had lied about her age being 48 when he was only 32. Nichols had previously been investigated in connection to her disappearance, but he claimed to have lied to law enforcement when Jewel had been reported missing, saying he had heard from her and she was well and in Vancouver. Nichols is not being investigated for any other cold cases at this time. The Ottawa government is now working on extraditing Nichols to Canada hoping he will face charges in Ottawa. This case is still ongoing and Nichols has not been convicted at this time. Jewel's family is glad to have answers and in 2022 they had a small ceremony after her body had been sent back to Tennessee where her grave marker was changed from missing to finally home and at peace. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. It was on April 20th, 1978, when a woman named Cornelia Humphreyd was murdered in Germany when she was 18. She was found the day after the murder with her body dumped on the roadside with 14 stab wounds in her neck and back. Witnesses came forward early on in the investigation, saying that they saw a small car with a green license plate in the area. The American military stationed in Germany often used the green license plate. It was discovered that Cornelia had been having an extramarital affair with a man named Tommy Molina. He was 24 at the time. He was stationed in Germany with his first wife, and he owned a Fiat 124, which matched the description of the car seen leaving Cornelia's body. He was interviewed five days after Cornelia was discovered, but he said he'd been home with his wife that day. However, she couldn't remember. The German authorities and the American military didn't have much. He was not charged at that time. He would be interviewed again, but not until 1996, after his now third wife reported to military officials that while intoxicated in 95, he confessed multiple times to her that he had killed a woman in Germany with a knife. He told her he was having an affair and that she had gotten pregnant and had threatened to tell his wife. Again, he was questioned in 1996 and he strongly denied any involvement and the investigation moved slowly again after that. But later with advancements in DNA technology, the investigators reopened the case. In 2019, the German government requested a new blood sample taken from Cornelia's body. Federal warrant was issued and in 2020, they collected fresh DNA and in 2021, they confirmed the match of DNA that was collected off Cornelia clothing to Tommy Molina. Tommy Molina is now 69 years old. He was arrested on June 21, 2023 and charged with the murder of Cornelia Humphrey. He is currently awaiting extradition to Germany where he could face 15 years in prison if convicted. It was on April 16, 1991, at approximately 3 a.m. when Toronto police officers responded to a 911 call at 149 Dundas Street East, just west of Jarvis Street in Toronto, 
Canada, officers would find a man suffering from multiple stab wounds. The victim soon died at the scene. He would later be identified as Herbert Boone, a 43-year-old Toronto resident originally from Newfoundland. Herbert didn't live in the apartment he was found, was known to be a short-term or low-rent apartment. Police would find evidence that the killer had washed out the blood in the bathroom and the killer had thrown his blood-soaked clothes in a nearby dumpster. His murder case would quickly go cold. Toronto police couldn't connect anyone to the crime. However, in June 2023, Toronto police announced that they had positively identified the killer. They identified Kevin Welsh, who they stated they'd used DNA testing on preserved evidence to determine the Toronto residence was the killer. Walsh was 46 years old at the time of the killing, and it's not known what sparked the altercation. Fortunately, Kevin Walsh died in 2007. Authorities said that if he were alive today, he could be charged with one count of second-degree murder. Police have not released what DNA technology was used to identify Walsh, but they did release that it was Walsh who was staying in the apartment where Boone had been found in 1991. However, authorities are still asking anyone with information about the murder. It was on March 3, 2022, around 9 p.m., when Corey Richens and her husband Eric Richens were celebrating her buying a new home for her real estate business. During the celebration around 11 p.m., Corey made her husband a nightcap, his favorite, a Moscow mule. The drink is vodka based with big hits of mint and lime and topped with ginger beer. That's going to be important later. She brought the drink to their bedroom, where he started drinking it in bed. The couple had been working on their marriage after having a bit of a rough patch. Corey had told friends that things had been getting better. Eric and Corey had three sons. They shared a home in Camus, Utah. Camus gives residents the feel of rural living with large estates. It's approximately 40 miles east of Salt Lake City. The family had the ability to live a luxurious lifestyle, never wanting for anything with a large home and all the extras that they could possibly want. After giving Eric the drink, Corey claimed that she'd went to bed shortly after. But before she fell asleep, one of her sons woke her up after having a nightmare. She claimed that she stayed in his room to soothe him back to sleep and also fell asleep there. She stated that she woke in the middle of the night around 3 a.m. before returning to her bed. There, she found her husband slumped on the floor at the end of the bed. She touched his foot and found it cold to the touch. She claimed that she got her phone that she had left plugged in on her side of the bed and called 911. She then started to perform CPR. First responders arrived attempting to revive Eric, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. This is the story that Corey Richens told police when they interviewed her. The autopsy would show a different story. When the toxicology report came back, it revealed that Eric Richens died from a fentanyl overdose that was five times a lethal dose. Medical examiner report that the fentanyl had been orally ingested, which was noted as unusual. Law enforcement interviewed Corey. In the interview, the detective would inform Corey about the fentanyl overdose. In the interview, Corey was adamant that her husband didn't do drugs. The detective conducting the interview would also say that they were starting to look at how the drug got into his system and that they would need to search the house for all electronics. During the interview, they also seized Corey's cell phone, which she had just brought. Here are some snippets of the transcription from that interview. Corey Richens, he doesn't do drugs. Detective Woody, we're going to go check the house. We want to make sure there's nothing there because this is super dangerous. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for your kids. Later in the interview, Detective Woody, it's kind of odd that there was nothing there that we saw. You know, I don't know if you were trying to clean it up so he wouldn't get in trouble or this didn't get out. So we also have warrants for all electronics so that in case you ordered anything on the phone, if you tried to keep us, Corey Richens, is it cut crack? Like it's Detective Woody, it's fentanyl, that it's a pretty deadly drug. It's something that's not, it's becoming more common. Then the interview ends with them leaving with Corey to go search the house. Police would start to investigate the death as suspicious, possibly a homicide. Not every overdose would be suspicious, but Eric was not known to have a drug problem, and everyone who knew Eric knew that he loved his family very much, and he had every intention to stay a part of that family. The family home was searched, and the electronics including Corey's phone, were taken into evidence. But who is Eric Richens? 
Eric was born on May 13, 1982. He was 39 when he died. He reportedly was an excellent outdoorsman, hunting, and worked on his family cattle farm. He was the oldest with two younger sisters. When he was younger, he worked and learned about working on the ranch, tending to cattle and horses, hauling hay and feeding the animals. But he also had a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah in international studies with a minor in Spanish. He learned Spanish during a two-year mission with his church to Mexico. He owned a successful high-end masonry business, specializing in high-end projects. He owned the company with his friend, Cody Wright. Corey and Eric met while Corey worked at Home Depot as a front counterperson. They got married in 2013 in a backyard wedding at the home they shared and welcomed three sons age 10, 9, and 6 today. Eric was a coach or assistant coach on all of his son's sports teams. He was known to be very involved and dedicated to the teams that he worked with. Corey was Eric's second wife. He'd been previously married to Julie Jorgensen, whom he married in 2005. There's not much information about this marriage, but they divorced in 2009 and Julie passed away in 2011. Eric and Corey signed a pretty tight prenup agreement, which stated that Corey wouldn't get any of Eric's assets in the event of divorce. She would only inherit his estate in the event of his death. From the outside, it appeared that they had a great marriage and a successful life to the outside world. They had a massive home worth $1.1 million and everything they could want or need. In 2019, Corey started her company, K. Richens Realty LLC, where she was a real estate agent. And according to her company, she would buy and flip homes. Future findings would show that she was constantly losing money with this venture. Financial records would begin to paint a picture of just how unsuccessful Corey was with money. After Eric's death, it would come out that Eric had talked to his family about wanting a divorce, but he planned to stay in the marriage for the kids. Some reports said that Corey had stated that Eric was having an affair and that she had moved out some of his clothes, but that they had gone to counseling and things had been well before his death. However, the media and court documents began to paint a different story. It showed that in September 2020, Eric discovered that his wife had racked up a substantial amount of debt with her business and that she had been stealing from him to pay for it. She had stolen excess of $200,000 and charged more than $30,000 to his private credit cards. He also discovered that she had fraudulently borrowed $250,000 using a forged power of the fraudulent power of attorney had been dated and signed in 2013, but not notarized until 2018. She had also taken money that had been set aside to pay his business taxes. The amount that Corey stole seemed to be never-ending, but ultimately she promised to repay the stolen money back from the accounts. In November 2020, Eric had also decided to put the house and all of his assets into a living trust that his sister, Katie Rich and Benson, is the trustee for, and she was also made the representative for the estate of Eric Richens. It is believed that Eric did this because he felt he could no longer trust his wife. Eric and his business partner had life insurance policies out in each other's names, which is standard practice just so that the other can buy out the estate of the other partner if anything were to happen. It was discovered that in January 2022, Corey changed the beneficiary to herself on Eric's policy. It was something that he discovered and quickly changed it back. Shortly after this incident on Valentine's Day, Eric got violently sick from eating and would express fears to a friend that he thought his wife might be to blame. It is also believed that Corey had two life insurance policies taken out in Eric's name without his knowledge, one from 2014 and one from January 2022. The policies where Corey was the sole beneficiary, she had all the information sent to a P.O. box that Eric nor his estate knew about. After his death, she filed death claims on both of these policies and received $1.5 million directly benefiting from the death of her husband. After Eric's death, Corey would go on living her life. Some would think extravagantly. She took her kids on trips and kept living life as usual but with more money in the bank. Almost a year to the day of Eric's death on March 7, 2023, Corey published a book called Are You With Me? It was a children's book about a boy who had lost his father and could feel his presence afterward. It covers topics on feeling if someone is with you after they die. A few weeks after the book's release, she was on a local morning news show in Salt Lake City to promote the book. She had seemed cold and disconnected, 
but she credits her son in helping her write the book with her. She said that it was written to help them understand that her husband is with them even if he wasn't there. She wrote it as a comfort to her sons and others experiencing the loss of a loved one. She dedicated the book to her husband, saying, quote, to my amazing husband and wonderful father. The book is no longer available on Amazon. On May 8, 2023, Corey was arrested and charged with aggravated murder and three counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. The following is the prosecution and estate of Eric Richens, belief of the events that led to his death and after. On May 2, 2023, the police interviewed a woman only disclosed as CL. At this time, her full name is being held for privacy. She's a known acquaintance of Corey Richens, who had previously cleaned her house and some of the properties Corey was flipping. CL is also known to have past charges of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. She's not been charged with anything at this time. Between December 2021 and February 2022, Corey reached out repeatedly to CL, once was asking if she could get pain meds for an investor with back pain. CL contacted an acquaintance known as Acquaintance 1 who got in contact with a dealer known as Acquaintance 2 and was able to procure hydrocodone pills for Corey, which Corey paid for by leaving money for CL at a house that she owned at the time. Two weeks later, Corey asked CL to get something more potent like, quote, that Michael Jackson stuff. She then asked for fentanyl. CL then contacted the dealer again on February 11, 2022 and got 15 to 30 pills that Corey paid $900 for. She picked them up at CL's house. There are two reports of what happened on Valentine's Day 2022. In one document, Eric ate a sandwich that Corey had left on the seat of his truck with a love note. After eating it, Eric immediately got hives and had difficulty breathing. The other account, which is the arrest warrant, said that Corey and Eric were having dinner at their home when Eric got very ill after dinner and believed that he'd been poisoned. In both of these options, it was reported that Eric contacted a friend and said he believed poison him. There is no evidence that Eric acted against his wife on this belief. Almost two weeks after Valentine's Day, on February 26, 2022, Corey contacted CL again, asking for another $900 of fentanyl, which CL procured and left in a fire pit at another house connected to Corey. Six days later, Eric Richen died of a fentanyl overdose. Another piece of evidence was that on the night that Eric died, Corey had stated that she left her phone in the bedroom when she went to sleep with her son. However, the data on her phone showed that it was opened and moved multiple times between 10.30 p.m. and 3.20 a.m., including at 3.08 p.m. when the phone was moved more than 250 feet. An expert at Corey's bail hearing stated that it could have been a device connected to the phone that caused the pings, for example, a smartwatch. There was also evidence that Corey had messaged someone several times during the time she was supposed to be sleeping. Those text messages had been deleted and never recovered. It is also stated that the person who received the messages had also deleted them. That person's name has been kept out of the media and court records. Corey also said in her original statement that she had performed CPR on her husband. Still, when EMS arrived and started to perform CPR, Eric began to foam at the mouth, which was an indicator that no one had tried to perform CPR previously. Corey later texted her best friend saying, quote, I pumped so damn hard, so hard, screaming at him to come back to life. After Corey's first phone was taken into evidence, she got a new phone which was later taken into evidence. This phone had some disturbing web searches in its history, which included, can you delete everything in an iCloud account? Can you delete text messages to be retrieved? From an iPhone? Can cops uncover deleted messages? iPhone? How to permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely? Can cops force you to do a lie detector test? What are you allowed inside Utah jails? Will life insurance pay if death certificate says pending? Luxury prisons for the rich in America? If someone is poisoned, what does it go down on a death certificate as? FBI analysis of electronics in an investigation. Can FBI find deleted messages? What does FBI do with electronics for searches? Can the cause of death be changed on a death certificate? What is considered a lethal dose of fentanyl? Before being arrested, investigators had asked Corey if she'd taken any vacations. 
She responded in an email, quote, You asked about any exotic vacations. I have taken since Eric's passing. I went on two trips last year. One, my kids tried out for a soccer camp in Salt Lake City to qualify to play in Spain in June and both my kids made it. So yes, I took them to Spain in October 2022. I've attached their invitation letters. Another message read, quote, I took my kids and my mom came with us in August of 2022 to Mexico. As I hope you understand, the months prior to this since Eric's death have been hard to deal with. She also went on to talk about how she and Eric went to Mexico every year and that they hadn't gone this year because Eric went on a hunting trip in January instead. On June 12, 2023, Corey Richens had her bail hearing. She kept seeing a white blouse and dress pants and handcuffed in the courtroom. She had been wiping her eyes with no visible tears and seemed sad while evidence was given and she was held without bail and awaiting trial. In June, Corey filed a lawsuit suing the estate of Eric Richens for $2 million and the house that they shared. Eric bought the house in 2012 before they got married without Corey and never added her name to the house. He had also added the house to his living trust in 2020. Also on June 27, 2023, Eric's sister, Katie Richen Benson, filed a lawsuit suing Corey in civil court on behalf of the living trust and the estate of Eric Richens and was asking for $13 million. That case states that Corey is responsible for the death of Eric and should not have profited from his death. Also, Corey had stolen property from the estate, including money from a safe, vehicles that had belonged to Eric, and some off-road vehicles. The civil case also includes the book that Corey wrote, saying it is an unlawful book and that she used Eric's name and likeness without permission for the book. Eric's family has also stated that they believe Corey is the only one who could have killed Eric and he had no history of drugs. Corey herself also said that he didn't do drugs. Corey seems to have calculated how to kill her husband and worked hard to profit from his death. For the murder charge alone, Corey faces 25 to life in prison if convicted. Corey has maintained her innocence during every stage of this investigation so far. Corey has not been found guilty and no trial date has been set yet, but it will likely be in 2024. The criminal and civil trial are still ongoing and are currently being investigated. If you would like me to cover this case moving forward or the trial to come, let me know down below. A Delray Beach, Florida construction worker saw an odd item floating in the intercoastal waterway. It appeared to be a suitcase bobbing along the water. As it moved and as he watched it move with the tide, he saw a human body part protruding from the bag. Delray PD were called and arrived on the scene along with the Coast Guard and secured the bag. Inside were the partial dismembered human remains. They continued to investigate the area and found two more bags with the remains of a single female victim. They stated that the victim was in the early stages of decomposition, putting her time of death sometime between July 17th and 20th. Her identity is currently unknown, with no missing persons matching her description. They say that the woman is either white or Latin American, 5 feet 4 inches, with brown hair and brown eyes and has tattooed eyebrows. Her estimated age is between 30 and 50. She was wearing a tank top with a unique pattern. The shirt was traced back to a Brazilian brand, Bezabe. She was wearing black shorts and a black undershirt as well. The suitcases were all tied with red ribbons, and law enforcement has provided images of two of the three suitcases. At this time, law enforcement is not revealing the cause of death. Law enforcement is asking residents in the area to check their security footage of any suspicious activity from July 15th to 24th. In early July, following an anonymous tip, Mexican and U.S. authorities investigated reports of a mass gravesite in Reynosa, Mexico, a border town only four miles from the U.S. border. Volunteers with the group, for the love of the disappeared, consisting solely of relatives of the missing and murdered persons in Mexico, conducted the search and uncovered what is believed to be the skeletal remains of approximately 27 people. The remains were discovered to be dismembered, making both identification and cause of death difficult to determine. However, relatives were able to identify four victims based on tattoos, though DNA confirmations have yet to be conducted. A 
Officials in Mexico have stated that a thorough investigation will be conducted to identify the persons found. This is, unfortunately, a concerning trend in recent years, with several mass grave sites being found across the country. According to the Advocacy for Human Rights in the Americas, there are over 100,000 missing people in Mexico, and gangs or cartels abduct, murder, and dump victims into mass graves much like this one. Investigating these tips can also be quite dangerous for the volunteers, as cartels have been known to leave false tips and hide explosives. Dozens of people, including some children, have been casualties. After multiple attacks, Mexico has decided to stop having law enforcement show up to these areas to search. Now, search parties mostly consist of mothers of these missing loved ones. A heartbreaking sacrifice these volunteers are making to restore some answers to families. A Portland, Oregon jury is currently deciding the fate of 38-year-old Tony Klein. The former nurse has been found guilty of using his position of authority to intimidate his patients at the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility. Klein was employed there from 2010 to 2018, and during his time there, he used his position at the facility to isolate and abuse inmates who came into the medical unit for treatment as well as inmates who worked in the department as orderlies. He resigned when abuse allegations started to be investigated by Oregon State Police. The U.S. Attorney's Office said in a statement to the media, quote, By virtue of his position as a medical provider, Klein was often alone with his victims and assaulted many before, during, and after medical treatments. For women who worked in the medical unit, Klein manufactured reasons to get them alone in secluded areas such as medical rooms, janitor's closets, or behind privacy curtains. Klein made it clear to his victims that he was in a position of power over them and that they would not be believed if they tried reporting his abuse. An investigation into Klein began in 2018 when an inmate came forward with a federal lawsuit against Oregon Department of Corrections for a culture of abuse and abuse and directly named Klein as a perpetrator of a significant portion of that abuse. His trial began in July and the jury took two days to deliberate the verdict. He was found guilty of 17 counts of sexual assault and four counts of making false statements under oath in his 2019 deposition. He faces life in prison and his sentencing is set for October 17th. Henry Lee is a famous, now-celebrity forensic scientist. According to his website, he claims to have been involved in solving 8,000 cases over his impressive five-decade-long career. Cases he has provided his expertise on include the John Benet Ramsey investigation and the O.J. Simpson trial. He was a blood spatter expert for the Michael Peterson trial. He also worked on the Kaylee Anthony murder investigation. He grew to be a highly desired trial expert, not only in the U.S., but across the globe. His fame also led him to become a serial regular on crime TV programs like Forensic Files, leading him to get his own TV show. However, some of his methods have been called into question. In 2007, he was accused of withholding key evidence in the Phil Spector trial, but it was deemed a mistake and he was never held accountable for that. Two men convicted of a murder in 1985, Ralph Birch and Sean Henning, filed an appeal citing wrongful conviction and asked to have key evidence used to convict them be retested. The items in question was a towel Henry Lee had testified to contain blood. The appeal was approved and the towel was submitted to modern forensic examination. During that re-examination, it was discovered that the towel had never been previously tested and no blood was found. Henry Lee had lied about crucial evidence that had been used to convict two men of murder, and they had been in prison for nearly as long as Lee's career. In 2020, their conviction was vacated, which then led the two men to filing a federal lawsuit, citing Henry Lee and eight other members of law enforcement as responsible for their wrongful conviction. On July 21, 2023, the federal judge posited over the lawsuit deemed Lee liable for falsifying evidence, along with the prosecutors and the new Milford Police Department. For Lee, this will likely end in paying out damages to the victims, however, he has denied any wrongdoing. Hennings, in a statement to the media, said, quote, I'm not looking for just compensation in terms of money. I want there to be changes in our system. There is no such thing as justice. You will never get back what they took from you. There's no getting my life back. They took 30 birthdays, 30 summers, weddings, Christmases, funerals, New Year's. 
There's no words for what they've done to me and my co-defendant. There's no words to describe what it feels like to be in prison for something you didn't do and sit and think, why did this happen? And why is no one coming to fix what they did? There's no words for that. At this point in time, there's no word yet on whether Henry Lee's other cases will be re-examined or if he'll be barred from any further work as a trial expert. Zachary Shake was arrested on July 20th when it was discovered that he'd been posing as a 17-year-old high school student in Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln Northwest High School had been the same high school that he'd graduated from nearly a decade ago. Shake had been using an elaborate scheme to locate, manipulate, and coerce victims to participate in sexual activities that he then distributed online. Some of the victims, all female, were as young as 13. He was arrested and charged with two counts of sexual assault and the use of an electronic device and one count of sex trafficking, a minor. The school district contacted law enforcement when it was discovered that a man had been attending the school with fraudulent documents. Sheik had been documents described as well-crafted, which included a falsified birth certificate under the name Zach Hess, transcripts from other schools, immunization records, and other medical records. At this time, victims are still coming forward, but it appears to be a significant amount of young girls who communicated with this man. The exact scope of the victims is unknown at this time, but parents are encouraged to speak to their children. At this time, Sheikh has admitted to impersonating a student, but has denied sexually assaulting any of his victims physically. He is currently being held on a $250,000 bond. Court records have been sealed to protect the identities of the victims. Now when asked how this could happen, officials revealed that Syke is 5 feet 4 inches, 120 pounds, and quote, blended in with the other students. On July 13th, first responders were called to a grocery store in Evergreen Park, Illinois. An active shooter was reported, but there was only one victim who was identified as 21-year-old Jalene Flores. The victim had been in the stockroom when her ex-boyfriend came into the store and shot her multiple times. She was declared deceased at the scene. Armani Henry was arrested later that day and charged with first-degree murder. Jalene had recently ended the relationship and had sought out a protective order against Henry, and it had been granted, but it had never been served. Three days before she was murdered, she discovered an Apple AirTag on her vehicle. She and her brother discovered that the AirTag was connected to Henry's cell phone and smashed it. He later turned up at her place of work, threatening her and her family if she cut contact with him. She had filed a second protective order the day before the attack. Her cell phone showed that on July 13th, she had 124 text messages from Henry threatening to kill her. According to court records from Chicago, Armani Henry had a history of domestic violence and had previously been convicted of battery. He has been charged with murder and is being held in custody while he waits his next court date on August 11th. 36-year-old Peaches Sturgo has been sentenced to three years in prison for defrauding an elderly man experiencing a cognitive decline of his entire life savings. Sturgo met the victim eight years ago on a dating website, and since then, Pose is not only a companion to the victim, but also is working from various financial institutions. She created fake emails and posed as a bank employee convincing the man that he had outstanding the victim was 86, a Holocaust survivor, and he lost his home in the process. The frauds were only discovered when the victim's son began going through his financial records. Sturgo, on the other hand, moved into a gated community, had multiple vehicles which included a boat, went on lavish vacations, and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on designer purchases, and often went to the victim's home to steal items to resell. Text messages between her and her real-life partner revealed that she often would make fun of the victim for believing that she loved him and lamented when he couldn't send her any more money. She also said in text messages, quote, I'm just aggravated, hurt, frustrated that I haven't made money. I don't want to work. It's too hard. Sturgo was arrested on January 2023 and charged with one count of wire fraud. She was pleaded guilty to the charge. The victim sent a letter to the courts during the sentencing hearing and he said, quote, as a Holocaust survivor, I have endured unspeakable pain and loss in my life. 
but never did I imagine that I would be subjected to such heartless betrayal in my old age. At the age of six, I lost both my parents in the Holocaust. It wasn't until ten that I had an opportunity to sit at a school desk for the first time. He also wrote, quote, I grew up in a boarding school surrounded by the echoes of the horrors I had experienced. Determined to make a better life for myself, I moved to the United States in my early twenties. Over the next sixty years, I worked tirelessly to establish a successful business, family, and home in New York. And now I'm 88 years old. And the last thing I expected was to finish my days in the same manner I started them, penniless and betrayed. The judge noted that the exceptional cruelty Sturgo placed upon the victim, and she was sentenced at the end of July to 51 months in prison and was ordered to pay back just over $2.8 million to the victim. She was also ordered to forfeit the home she purchased, jewelry, Rolex watches, and 100 luxury items. A 67-year-old man, Ivan Sevestino, walked into a Wells Fargo in Lakewood, New Jersey, and attempted to rob the bank by slipping a note to the teller. The teller simply said no, so the man walked out of the Wells Fargo and went across the street to a TD bank. At the second bank, the man repeated the same process, handing the same note to the teller. At the TD, the teller handed over 1500 cash and Ivan walked out. This isn't Ivan's first time making the news. In 2018, he was charged with a dozen counts of animal cruelty when it was discovered he was hoarding cats in his home. Over 50 animals were removed by the SBCA in what was described as a deplorable living condition. Ivan then robbed another bank on July 6th and was arrested shortly after. He has been charged with two counts of robbery and is being held in county jail while he waits for further court proceedings. It was around 1 a.m. on July 28th when a family discovered a man stuck in their chimney. The man was known to the family and was 47-year-old Irvin Ortiz Guzman and had been violating a protection order against him while trying to break in. Guzman had made it about two-thirds down the way of the chimney before the flue became too narrow and he found himself lodged inside. He screamed, which alerted the family inside, and they called 911. Firefighters had to work for two hours to pull him back up the chimney. He was extracted without any serious injuries, but was taken to the hospital for treatment for minor issues. Guzman now faces criminal trespassing charges and violating a protection order. Firefighters would like to remind the public that despite chimneys being okay for Santa to get in and out of, humans are not capable of going down chimneys.